It is good to be back. I've been gone for a while now, taking a much needed, though not planned, break from content creation. I've got some major plans for the future, and I've got a little teaser for you at the end of the video if you make it there. Today, I've got a super special challenge in store. The starter Pokémon for this run was caught during one of my previous challenges, the Chimchar only through Pokémon Platinum Solo run, which I'll put a link to up in the corner. Normally, when we begin a solo run, I go through resetting for the correct nature for our starter. This time, though, we won't be doing that since I don't want to edit the stats in my Shinx in any way. Before we start the challenge, let's go over the rules real quick. Rule number one, no glitches, hacks, or cheats. I do, however, use speed up, otherwise these videos would take far longer to produce and I'd rather produce them quickly. Rule number two, I can only use one Pokemon in battle. However, because I am not cheating, I do need to use HM Pokemon for travel purposes only. And lastly, rule number three, no items in battle. This doesn't include held items, as I use Everstones during some runs, and so other held items are also allowed if necessary. I need to cover just a few extra things before we start the challenge. I ran a Discord poll alongside a YouTube poll to determine whether or not we would use Following Platinum in future Platinum runs. This is a patch to the game that effectively just adds the Following Pokémon feature from Heart Gold and Soul Silver into Platinum. There is a version of Following Platinum that adds the Fairy type, but we won't be using that since I want these challenges to be as close to a normal game experience as possible, albeit with the Following Pokémon feature. As far as I am aware, the version of Following Platinum that I am using changes nothing else within the game other than adding the Following Pokémon feature from Hard Gold and Soul Silver. I am using version 1.1 of Following Platinum, so if you're interested in using it, you can do a bit of googling to find out more for yourself. I don't know if I can include the link without YouTube getting mad at me, so yeah. Anyways, the results of the polls I ran on Discord as well as YouTube came back pretty strongly in favor of adding Following Platinum, so here we are. If you think that I shouldn't use Following Platinum in future challenges for Platinum, please let me know down in the comments. We start off the challenge by selecting a random starter, beating Barry, and then immediately swapping out the starter with Aram, our shiny Shinx. Normally, I would swap out the starter choices themselves, but as far as I know, this is the only way to ensure that Aram here has the exact IVs and nature that it is supposed to have, so I'm gonna say that the first battle with Barry just doesn't count for the video. As far as Aram herself goes, she's pretty good. She's got the hasty nature and rivalry as her ability. Not the best nature for us, but definitely something that we can work with. Now that Aram has safely been added to our team, we need to get into the first major step in the road to victory. Aram needs to EV train. Ever since I caught Aram in that earlier Chimchar solo run, I've always wanted to see what Aram could do, so we're going to do our absolute best to make sure that she succeeds. While on Route 202, we knock out 252 Starly for speed EVs and 252 Shinx for attack EVs. We speed through Jubilife City and battle Barry with Aram for the first time. It's worth noting that Aram is at a pretty high level at the moment due to our EV training, so already Aram isn't listening to me. Yes, Aram is not listening to me. When I said that I didn't want to alter any stats at all on Aram, I meant it. That includes the original trainer data. What that means is that Aram here is basically never going to listen to us during this challenge since we're almost always above the obedience levels associated with the badges, as you can see here. I don't know if it's possible for a disobedient Shinx to beat Pokémon Platinum, but we're gonna find out. Anyways, Starly outspeeds us with Quick Attack on the first turn while Arm ignores us, but fortunately for us on the next turn, Arm switches up our orders and one-shots Starly with Spark. Following Starly is Piplup, and here Arm actually listens, and we're able to obliterate Piplup with Thunderfang. Does it feel a bit early for a very difficult, borderline insanity-inducing battle? I think it's a bit early. Not a single first gym leader has ever given me this much trouble before. Not with Caterpie, not with Weedle, not even Cricketot was this bad. Our battles with Rourke were completely ridiculous, and I wouldn't wish this torment on anyone. Finally, after many attempts, this battle takes place. Rourke leads with his Geodude, which we're able to outspeed, but sadly Aram ignores orders and uses Spark, doing nothing while Geodude hits us back with Rock Throw. On the next turn, Aram obeys and lands Bite, one-shotting Geodude. Up next is Onyx, and Aram is once again hit for free by Rock Throw, this time being a crit since she refuses to listen. To make matters worse, Aram then hurts herself in confusion on the next turn because she still won't listen, as well as getting hit with another Rock Throw. At last, Aram uses Bite and we get lucky with Flinch. On the next turn, we're able to knock out Onyx with another Bite. At this point, Kranidos is sent out, and we've never been able to get this far in all of our prior attempts. We get extremely lucky, and Aram decides to listen, meaning that we can one-shot Kranidos with Bite to finally end this torment. What a nightmare. 
Climbing out of the bottomless pit of despair that was Orberg, we head over to our next battle, this time facing off against Team Galactic Commander Mars. Mars leads with her Zubat, and the first thing that we do is knock off half of our own health by hitting ourselves in confusion before getting hit with Bite. Awesome. On the next turn, Arm refuses to listen, and we're again hit with Bite. Finally, Arm obeys and lands return, crushing Zubat into nothing. Mars then sends out her last Pokémon, Perugly, who causes us to flinch with Fake Out. Arm didn't take too kindly to that Fake Out, and so she agrees to use Thunderfang on the next turn to obliterate Perugly. Now listen, I'm a huge fan of Gardenia. She's a cool gym leader, and as far as I know, she is the only gym leader in all of Pokémon that uses one of the regional starters as part of her team. That said, her Turtwig gave us so many issues, let alone her Cherim and Roserade. Like Rourke, Gardenia was extremely difficult for Arm to take on, as you can see. After that gauntlet of pain, we stumble into this particular battle. As usual, Gardenia leads with her terrifying Turtwig, and as usual, Arm doesn't obey us. Turtwig uses Reflect, and on the next turn, we land Crunch before Turtwig uses Sunny Day. Arm then switches up our orders and gets a crit return, knocking out Turtwig. Gardenia then sends out her Cherim, who transforms in the sunlight and uses Safeguard while Arm refuses to listen to us again. On the next turn, Arm switches up our orders and uses Spark, while Cherim uses Leech Seed to sap away at our health every turn. Arm again switches up our orders, but this time Arm uses Return and obliterates Cherim's forehead. Gardenia sends out her last Pokémon, Roserade, right as the sunlight fades. Finally, for the first time in this battle, Arm listens to us on the first turn against a new foe and manages to one-shot Roserade with a devastating crunch. Gardenia is finally Gardagon. Before we leave Eterna City, there's another mandatory encounter we need to overcome. Team Galactic Commander Jupiter. Jupiter leads with her Zubat, who I was worried would confuse us immediately. However, Aurum actually listens to us and instantly one-shots that poor creature with Thunderfang. Jupiter's last Pokémon is her Skuntank, and here Arm switches our orders in favor of using Return. Skuntank tanks the Return and consumes its Citrus Berry before striking back at us with Night Slash. On the next turn, Arm completely ignores us, and we're hit with another Night Slash. Finally, Arm does listen to us again, and ends the battle with one last Thunderfang. After an easy win against Jupiter, I was a bit worried about our battles in Hearthome City. The first battle we need to get out of the way is against Fantina, who leads with her Duskull. Arm switches our orders on the first turn, opting to use Spark, and fortunately, that still takes down the Duskull. Up next is Miss Magius, who we were thankfully able to land Crunch against for a one-shot. Fantina's last Pokémon is her Haunter, and once more, Arum actually listens, resulting in a clean sweep of Fantina with just one more Crunch. I briefly mentioned earlier that we had multiple battles in Hearthome City, and usually Barry is the harder of the two. As you can see here, Barry gave us a bit of a hard time for a while. This was expected though, so not that big of a deal. After a few tries against Barry, our perseverance pays off in the form of this battle. Barry leads with his Staravia, as usual, which lowers our attack with Intimidate. For our first turn, Arm switches up our orders and uses Crunch, while Staravia uses Double Team. Fortunately, on the next turn, Arm listens, and our Spark is able to knock out Staravia. Up next is Ponyta, and once again, Arm listens to us and hits Ponyta with Return, but we don't knock it out and we're hit with Tail Whip. Arm refuses to obey us on the next two turns, meaning that we're hit with two tackles, but then Arm finally decides to use Crunch, letting us finish off Ponyta. Barry's next Pokémon is his Primplup, and while Arm does decide to switch up our orders, she actually uses Spark and we're able to one-shot this weird penguin before any shenanigans begin. Barry's last Pokémon is his Roselia, and sadly we're unable to one-shot with Return, meaning that we're stunned by Stun Spore. On the next turn, Roselia outspeeds us with Mega Drain, but Arm thankfully listens to us again, taking out Roselia and ending this battle for good. Upon arriving in Veilstone City, we have a brief encounter with Crasher Wake, who definitely won't be a problem later on in this run since we're using an Electric-type Pokémon, right? Well, anyways, we've reached Maylin, the fourth gym leader on our journey. She does give us a tiny bit of trouble, mostly because Arm won't listen to us, but that's pretty standard at this point. After a few attempts, we finally stumbled into this battle. Maylene leads with her Meditite, but our first turns are a bit odd considering Arm doesn't listen to us and Meditite misses the Rock Tomb. On the next turn, Arm listens to us and we're able to one-shot the Meditite with a devastating crunch. Lucario is up next, and thankfully we're able to outspeed with Thunderfang before we're hit with Force Palm. Arm listens to us yet again on the next turn with one more Thunderfang taking out Lucario. Maylene's last Pokémon is her Machoke, who we're also able to hit with Thunderfang. 
Sadly, we don't knock out the Machoke, meaning that we're hit with Rock Tomb and our speed is lowered. However, we still outspeed on the next turn, and even though Arm switches up our orders in favor of return, we still manage to get the win. Our next battle is against Barry again, but because we beat Maylene, Arm will actually be obedient for the first time in the video. Barry leads with his Staravia, lowering our attack, but it doesn't matter since we one-shot the Burb with Thunderfang. Up next is Ponyta, who we're able to hit with Return before getting stomped on. One more Return later and Ponyta goes down. Barry's next Pokémon is his Prinplup, who we hit with Thunderfang and Paralyze before we're hit with Bubble Beam. One more Thunderfang knocks out the Prinplup, meaning that Barry is on his last Pokémon, Roselia. We start off with a Thunderfang, hoping for a flinch, and we actually get it. On the next turn, we go for another Thunderfang, hoping for yet another flinch, and somehow we get it. One more Thunderfang is able to take down Roselia at long last. We got insanely lucky here with both of those flinches. I am amazed. Now that we've shoved Barry out of the way, we can try taking on Wake. There's a problem, though. Even though we're just barely hovering that obedience level cap, we just don't do enough damage to win. Fortunately for us, I've got some plans. The first thing we've got to do is grab the coin case. From here, we can purchase Game Corner coins until we have enough coins for some particular items. Unfortunately, we don't have enough money, and I'm not about to play the slots forever, so we've got to sell off almost everything that we own, as well as travel around the region, battling every trainer we can. Battling every trainer not only helps us with the money situation, but also gives Arm the levels we'll need to overcome Wake. While we're traveling around Sinnoh, we make a quick stop at Wayward Cave and grab the TM for Double Team. Better to get it for free than to buy it at the coin exchange. We make one last stop at the old chateau, and our reason for coming here is to grab the Dread Plate just in case we end up wanting to rely on Crunch. The last thing we have to do before challenging Wake again is to purchase more coins and then exchange those coins for two items that are very useful, the Silk Scarf and the Metronome. You might have noticed that we only spent half of our coins, which, uh, yeah, I might have thought that those items were double the price that they actually are and spent way more money than I needed to on coins. Anyways, we can finally challenge Wake again. I'm not going to show you every loss, as a lot of them I just reset on if Arum started with the wrong move, and there's a lot of attempts. Remember that Arum won't obey us anymore now that she is above level 50, and because of how the badges scale obedience, she'll never listen to us again from this point on. I spent several hours here resetting and just hoping Arum listened to me, wishing for crits and begging for the torment to end. Finally, we get to this attempt. Wake leads with his Gyarados, who really isn't a huge threat since we can one-shot it with Thunderfang if Arum listens. Thankfully, she does, and Gyarados is obliterated by a crit. Quagsire is sent up next, and once again, Arum listens to us and uses Return, but surprisingly we get yet another crit and one-shot the Quagsire. Wake's last Pokémon is his Floatzel, who we hit with Thunderfang but failed to knock out. Floatzel then eats its Citrus Berry and we're hit with Crunch, which also sadly lowers our defense. Thankfully, though, Arum listens to us one more time, and we're able to knock out Floatzel, defeating Wake at long last. Okay, so, uh, story time. I somehow lost my footage of this portion of the challenge. After beating Wake, we did all the usual story stuff, ending up in Celestic Town, where we battled Cyrus. Cyrus was honestly a pushover, since Arum was somewhere around level 60 when we got there. After beating Cyrus, we then had to make our way over to Conalave City, but here is where things got less easy. Barry kept beating us. Barry is one of the strongest rivals in the franchise, and this particular battle can be super difficult. We managed to get through, though, after several hours of attempts, and since Arum and I had come this far together, it felt like nothing could stop us. Nothing other than a steel wall, that is. We spent hours grinding on Iron Island. I brought Arum all the way up to level 100, hoping that we could somehow make it past Byron. It was all for naught. Byron was simply too powerful. Not only does Byron have some super tanky Steel-type Pokémon, but those Pokémon also have Ground-type moves that simply erase Arum from existence if she's hit by any of them. This, combined with Arum not listening to us, makes this fight simply impossible, or at least impossible for me. Even with the best of luck, I really doubt that it is possible to fight off both Byron's Pokémon and the Disobedience at the same time. It sucks, but this is where the run ends. Or at least, this is where the disobedient half of the run ends. What if things had been different? What if Arum listened to us like an actual starter? Could we beat Pokémon Platinum with only a Shinx if we didn't have to deal with Arum deciding to ignore more than half of our commands? When I started this video, I explained that I didn't want to edit Arum in any way. I wanted this experience to be with the very same Arum that I caught in my Chimchar solo run. So how could I get Arm to listen to me if I couldn't adjust her original trainer? 
Simple. We modify ourselves. I simply adjusted our trainer IDs to match those that Arm already had. We're out here becoming an entirely new person all for the sake of our little yellow lion lynx thing. Quickly speeding through this part, the rules are the same as they were in the previous attempt. We pick Chimchar, smack Barry around, and then swap out our Chimchar for Aram. This time, though, I've also edited my trainer data so that Aram believes that we are her original trainer. With that, we should be good to go for the rest of the run. We knocked out 252 of both Shinx and Starly, getting our EV set up once again. With that, we move directly into our second battle with Barry, and this time it should be a breeze. Barry leads with his Starly, who we turn into fried chicken with Spark. Barry's last Pokemon is his Piplup, who fares no better than Starly. Moving into our next battle, we're facing off against Rourke again. We're gonna pay him back for how awful our first battle was against him in the previous attempt. Rourke leads with his Geodude, but this poor rock creature can't even attack us because it flinches from our first attack, Bite. Rourke then tries to salvage the situation by using a potion, but that doesn't work out well since we can simply use Bite and then get a crit return to take Geodude down. We also gain a level and learn Thunderfang during this fight, which is a huge power boost for us. Rourke finally sends out his Onyx, who we also bite, but this time instead of a flinch, Onyx just whiffs Rock Throw. One more bite takes down Onyx, meaning that we're already face to face with Rourke's ace, Kranidos. Unfortunately for Kranidos, we utilize our recently obtained Thunderfang to end this battle in a single strike. Now that we've gotten our first gym badge, it's time for our first antagonist battle against Mars. Mars leads with her Zubat, and as you can guess, it stands no chance to our Thunderfang. Mars's last Pokemon is her Perugly, who has the audacity to use Fake Out against us. That Fake Out ultimately amounts to nothing, since on the following turn we close out the battle by using Return to punt Perugly into the stratosphere. After stumbling around in a dark forest and being haunted by mind demons, we make it to Gardenia and enter into our second gym challenge. Gardenia leads with Turtwig, the objectively cutest Sinnoh starter. Unfortunately for Turtwig, it being cute isn't enough to stop us from obliterating its forehead with Return. Gardenia then sends out her Cherim, who we also bonk into unconsciousness with Return. Gardenia's last Pokemon is her Roserade, and we decide to switch things up by knocking out Roserade with Crunch. I swear it wasn't because Roserade has a cabbage for a head. As it turns out, the giant Team Galactic building that we could see from the gym is actually a hideout for Team Galactic. Well, that just won't do, so we head over to begin a cleansing of sorts. Jupiter leads with her Zubat, who we immediately send to the next dimension by way of Thunderfang. Jupiter's last Pokemon is her Skuntank, and surprisingly, Skuntank survives our return before eating its Citrus Berry and hitting us back with Night Slash. Once again, though, we prove resistance is futile and close out the battle with another return. I knew we were going to need Double Team for this attempt, and instead of wasting my money at the game corner for it, I decided to grab it early on while we were passing Wayward Cave on our way to Hearthome. Once we get to Hearthome, we head straight to Fantina to get this sweep over with. Fantina leads with Duskull, who we crunch into nothing. Up next is Miss Magius, who also meets its end at our devastating crunch. Fantina's last Pokemon is her Haunter, who actually manages to strike us with Sucker Punch before we bring Haunter down with one last crunch. After acquiring our third gym badge, Barry has decided to challenge us to another battle. No big deal this time around, I hope. Barry leads with his Staravia, who lowers our attack with Intimidate before striking us with Quick Attack. Despite this, Thunderfang is able to make quick work of Staravia. Up next is Ponytot, who actually survives our return and hits us back with Ember. One more return takes down the Ponytot, but then Barry sends out his Prinplup. Once again, we're just short of knocking out Barry's Pokemon, with Prinplup surviving our Thunderfang. Thankfully, Prinplup is paralyzed, but we're still chipped away at with Bubble Beam. Finally, one more return takes down Prinplup. Barry's last Pokemon is his Roselia, and finally we're able to one-shot another Pokemon, a single return proving to be too much for this poor plant Pokemon. We get to Veilstone and grab the coin case real quick before giving Maylene a try. Unfortunately, our first attempt didn't go very well, as you can see. We don't stop when we get knocked down, though, so we get right back up into another round against Maylene. She leads with her Metatite, who uses Fake Out just to annoy us a bit before we terminate Metatite with Thunderfang. Maylene then sends out her Lucario, and again we use Thunderfang. We do a bit more than half of Lucario's health, and then we're hit with Force Palm for incredible damage, though we're thankfully not paralyzed this time. On the next turn, we're able to get by Lucario with another Thunderfang, but we don't have a lot of health left. Maylene's last Pokemon is her Machoke, who we hit with Thunderfang and failed to knock out. Machoke then hits us with Strength, and while I thought it was over, Aurum toughed it out with 5 HP remaining, letting us use one last return to secure the win and our third gym badge. Since we're in Veilstone and we have the cash, I decided to pick up a metronome for later on in the run.
We then trek over to Pastoria and run into our next battle against Barry. Barry leads with his Staravia as usual, lowering our attack immediately. We're then hit with Quick Attack, but we retaliate with a Crit Thunderfang to bring down the Burb. Up next is Ponyta, who shockingly survives our return, but chooses to use Tail Whip instead of anything actually important. We take it out with another return one turn later. Barry's next Pokémon is his Prinplup, and once again we fail to one-shot with Thunderfang, meaning that we're hit with Bubble Beam. One more Thunderfang brings down Primplup, meaning that Barry has to send out his last Pokémon, Roselia. Finally, we get to the return one-shot that we've been looking for and close out the battle. You're probably thinking right now, oh, Wake won't be that bad this time around since Arm will listen now. Surely the Water-type Gym Leader won't be that hard with an Electric-type Pokémon. Well, you'd be wrong. As you can see, Wake is still very challenging even when we have the type advantage and disobedience is no longer a factor. You've also likely noticed that we keep fainting to Floatzel, and that is because getting hit once by Quagsire means that Floatzel can take us out with Aqua Jet, which outspeeds our Thunderfang. But even if Floatzel doesn't use Aqua Jet, Gyarados' Intimidate lowers our attack just enough to where we can't one-shot the Floatzel. Ugh. After a few attempts, we dive into this battle. Wake leads with his Gyarados, which lowers our attack with Intimidate. Gyarados has a lot of nerve trying to intimidate us when it's four times weak to Thunderfang and even weaker to the crit we get. Up next is Quagsire, who we start setting up Double Team on, hoping for misses. Unfortunately, we're hit by Rock Tomb twice, which lowers our speed, but we successfully set up our Double Teams without too much fuss. We then get super lucky and land a crit return, one-shotting Quagsire. Wake's last Pokémon is his Floatzel, who misses its crunch, letting us hit it with Thunderfang for free. Floatzel then eats a Citrus Berry, misses Crunch again, and we're finally able to get past Wake with one more Thunderfang to finish off the fight. Aram and I take a trip up to Celestic Town after our win against Wake as a favor to Cynthia, and it is here that we battle against Cyrus for the first time. Cyrus leads with his Sneasel, who we bonk with Return for an easy one-shot. Up next is Golbat, who falls a victim to our Thunderfang. Following Golbat is Cyrus's last Pokémon, Murkrow, who is also added to the list of those who have met their end at the fangs of our Thunderfang. Now that we've done our errand for Cynthia, we're in for another tough battle with Barry in Conalave City. Barry's fifth fight is usually a steep increase in difficulty, and that hasn't changed in this run either. As you can see, Aram and I tried our absolute best against Barry, but his team is composed of many hard-hitting Pokémon that seldom miss. Barry's Empoleon and his Heracross stopped Aram and I in our tracks quite a few times. Not a huge deal in the long run, since there's a perfectly good spot to grind at right outside of Conalave City. I figured that there isn't a reason not to grind a little on the heavier side since the Disobedient run ended right after this battle with Barry, and given how our last few battles have gone, I anticipated that Byron would continue to be mega difficult. Anyways, with Arm gaining five more levels, we get back into the fray with Barry. Barry leads with his Staraptor, who lowers our attack with Intimidate. Once again, all of these Intimidate Pokémon tend to just stop existing when they're up against someone that has Thunderfang. Funny how that works. Up next is Rapidash, who we also chomp with Thunderfang, but we don't one-shot, and Rapidash is able to use Tail Whip. On the next turn, we simply Thunderfang again and take down the Rapidash. Following Rapidash's Heracross, and again we use Thunderfang, failing to one-shot and being hit with Brick Break as consequence. Another Thunderfang takes down Heracross easily enough. Barry's next Pokémon is his Empoleon, but this time we're able to annihilate this silly penguin. Barry's last Pokémon is Roserade, who we failed to one-shot, and I thought we'd fail this attempt too until Roserade used Toxic Spikes of all things. One turn later and one last Thunderfang brings us to the wind. Like his Bastidon, Byron is a massive adversary in these runs and always proves to be difficult. To account for this, I did a ton of extra grinding on Iron Island as I usually do in hopes that we could surpass the Bastion of Fortitude that is Byron. Byron leads with his Magneton and we begin the double team setup. Honestly, Double Team is the only way that you can get past this battle. Both the Steelix and the Bastiodon are super tanky and have the potential to hit really hard. After setting up our Double Teams, we finally strike twice with Return, taking out Magneton. Byron's next Pokémon is his Steelix, and we continue to just spam Return. Steelix sets up Sandstorm, which chips away at our health, but so too are we chipping away at Steelix while it fails to land any attacks. Byron then uses a full restore, and we've got to chop away at Steelix for a few more turns until it finally faints, while we're able to thankfully avoid all of Steelix's attacks. Byron's last Pokémon is his Bastiodon, and here we change up our strategy, landing four Thunderfangs to take out the Bastiodon without any trouble at all. 
We've got a quick meeting with Professor Rowan, but while that is going on, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone that has enjoyed my videos and that I'm sorry for the long delay on this one. I've got a ton of ideas for things I want to do on this channel, and if you stick around for the end of the video like I said at the start, you'll get a hint at what I'm working on for the next video. Alright, all that stuff out of the way, we've got a nerd to beat up. Saturn leads with his Golbat, who, as you can guess, falls to our Thunderfang. Next up is Toxicroak, who meets a swift end at the hands of our return. Saturn's last Pokémon is his Bronzor, and here we use Crunch to secure the one-shot. After beating up Saturn, we've got to go deal with another Team Galactic Commander, that being our second battle against Mars. Mars leads with her Golbat, who goes down to Thunderfang. Up next is Mars's Bronzor, and again we choose Crunch to deal with his adversary. Mars's last Pokémon is her Perugly, who has the audacity to use Fake Out against us, prompting us to end its free trial of life with a crit return. After a long hike to Snow Point City, we immediately face off against Candace. Candace leads with her Sneasel, who is immediately dealt with via return. Candace then sends out her Pillow Swine, but unfortunately for her, the bond Arm and I share at this point erases her Pillow Swine's health bar. Up next is Frostless, who we're actually able to outspeed with Crunch for a quick one-shot. Candace's last Pokémon is her Obama Snow, but once again, Return is able to make quick work of a tanky foe. We get into the thick of Team Galactic's plot and end up observing Cyrus' speech. I don't know what to put here as a joke, so I guess I'll come back to this later. Alright, now that Cyrus' amazing speech is over, we can have our rematch with Cyrus. Cyrus leads with his Sneasel, which faints to the overwhelming bond Arm and I have forged. Cyrus's next Pokémon is his own best friend, but sadly for Cyrus, his friendship with Crobat can't save it from our Thunderfang. Cyrus's last Pokémon is his Honchkrow, and once again, Cyrus finds himself cursing our Thunderfang. Cyrus dips and gives us the Master Ball for some reason, but even though Cyrus is left, Saturn stands in our way. Saturn leads with his Golbat, who we swiftly knock out with Return. Up next is Bronzor, and we break out Crunch once again to get Bronzor off the field as soon as possible. Saturn's last Pokémon is his Toxicroak, but like most foes, Toxicroak fails to withstand the pure power of friendship. After dealing with Saturn and climbing a literal mountain, we enter into a double battle against Mars and Jupiter alongside Barry. Mars and Jupiter lead off with their Bronzor, and sadly we can only take out one for now. We decide to sweep Mars first, using Crunch to knock out her Bronzor, while Jupiter's Bronzor uses Reflect and Barry's Munchlax does absolutely nothing of note as usual. On the following turn, Mars sends out her Perugly, who we obliterate with return before being struck by Bronzor's extrasensory. Mars then sends out her last Pokémon, Golbat, but we quickly take it out with Thunderfang, meaning that Mars is now out of the battle. We then turn our gaze to Jupiter, crunching Bronzor into dust. Jupiter then sends out her Skuntank, who surprisingly tanks our return even though we're at max friendship and level 100. Skuntank uses its one opportunity to attack to use Smokescreen, but Munchlax body slams it and even paralyzes it. One turn later and another return takes down the Skuntank. Jupiter's last Pokémon is her Golbat, but we miss our Thunderfang since Skuntank used Smokescreen earlier. Golbat then lands a crit sludge bomb that poisons us while Munchlax does nothing. On the next turn, we do end up landing our Thunderfang, one-shotting Golbat and getting through Mars and Jupiter's double battle at long last. Despite beating Mars and Jupiter, Cyrus's plans move forward without delay. Cyrus summons Dialga and Palkia, which causes the Lake Trio to show up, and it's a whole spectacle, one of the coolest in the franchise in my opinion. Before Cyrus can complete his goal though, Giratina shows up and drags Cyrus to the Distortion World, which means that we've got to follow him for some reason. At the bottom of the Distortion World, we find Cyrus throwing a temper tantrum. Cyrus leads with his Houndoom, who we deal with swiftly by knocking it out with friendship. Cyrus then sends out his Gyarados to lower our attack with Intimidate, but like with Wake's Gyarados, those that are four times weak to Thunderfang should just chill out. Cyrus's next Pokémon is his Weavile, which fakes us out for the first turn, but we outspeed it on the second. Surprisingly, Weavile of all things survives our return and hits us with an Ice Punch that freezes us. I cannot believe this. We're then hit with another Ice Punch while spending a turn frozen, but finally we thaw out and slap Weavile with another return to take it down. The next adversary is Honchkrow, but we know how to deal with flying types pretty well by now and simply Thunderfang to one-shot. Cyrus's last Pokémon is his Crobat, and surprisingly we outspeed, getting a crit Thunderfang to close out this last battle with Cyrus. We fulfill our plot duties and capture Garatina, naming it Mr. Wiggles as is tradition. After boxing Mr. Wiggles, we then have to retrieve the hyper-depressed man from the lighthouse he likes to hang out in. Wait, but I don't like to hang out in a lighthouse. Anyways, into our battle with Volkner. Volkner leads with his Jolteon, who we squish into pace with Return. Volkner then thought it was a good idea to send a rodent to fight a lynx, and it didn't work out very well for him. 
Valkner's next Pokémon is his Electivire, but not even his Chonky Boy can withstand our return. Valkner's last Pokémon is his Luxray, but Arum is simply built different and puts Luxray out of commission. It's time for one of the hardest fights in the game, our final battle with Barry. Barry is definitely one of the best rivals in my opinion, the dude has a super solid team and even at level 100 he was able to beat me plenty of times. What's super scary about Barry in particular is that his entire ideology on how Pokemon battles should work counters one of the few strats that I can use for really tough battles. See, Barry's team is centered around having impossible to miss moves, which makes our double team useless. But unlike what we experienced in the Krikatot video, I think there's still hope here. After many attempts, we find ourselves in this battle. Barry leads with his Staraptor, lowering our attack with Intimidate. Wasting no time, we take Staraptor out with Thunderfang before it can use U-Turn and Intimidate us a second time. Barry's next Pokémon is his Snorlax, and we go for a Thunderfang hoping for a flinch. We don't get it, and what we get instead is a huge Earthquake to the face, which takes about half of our health. One more Thunderfang takes out the Snorlax, though, so that's cool. Barry then sends out his Heracross, and we need a flinch now more than ever. We actually get the flinch with Thunderfang, meaning that we can take out Heracross with another Thunderfang on the next turn. Rose Raid is up next, and we use Return, getting an easy one-shot. Rapid Ash is Barry's next Pokémon, and we get another one-shot with Thunderfang. Barry's last Pokémon is his Empoleon, and with one last Thunderfang, we're able to overcome the wall that was Barry. Getting into the Elite Four, Aaron is our first opponent. Aaron leads with his Yanmega, and we quickly take it out with Thunderfang before it does any crazy speed shenanigans. Aaron then sends out his Heracross, and fortunately for us, we can reliably knock out Heracross with Return. Up next is Vespaquin, and yet again we get another one-shot with Friendship. Aaron's next Pokémon is his Scizor, but this time we only do half health with Return, meaning that we're hit with x -Scizor. On the next turn, we're able to bring down Scizor with another Return. Aaron's last Pokémon is his Drapion, and it too withstands our Return, eating a Citrus Berry before hitting us with Cross Poison. On the next turn, we're able to bring down Drapion with one more Return. It is time for another nightmare, someone even more horrible to battle against than Byron could ever be. The trainer I feared the most in the whole run. I always had hope for Byron, but Bertha? She has long been what I thought the final boss of the run would be. I don't have the footage to showcase all of the attempts against Bertha since I was resetting Lost Fights so fast, but just know that I spent a long, long time here, longer than any other fight in this whole video. Getting into the fight, Bertha leads with her Whiskash, and this is the best Pokémon for us to set up our double teams against, seeing as Whiskash will usually set up Sandstorm on the first turn, and following moves will be Earth Power, which already have a non-zero chance of missing by default. We set up four double teams, not risking any more than that, and then finally we strike Whiskash with Return for a one-shot. Bertha's next Pokémon is her Hippowdon, who sets up another Sandstorm, but we're able to one-shot it with Return as well. Bertha then sends out her Golem, and we get super lucky here, getting a crit and letting us get by the Golem without much issue. However, Bertha's Rhyperior is up next, and any attack from this beast can end us. We land Return and dodge an Earthquake, land another Return, proc a Citrus Berry, dodge another Earthquake. Finally, we land one more Return and get past the Rhyperior. Bertha's last Pokémon is her Gliscor, who we bring an end to with Return. Flint is our next opponent in the Elite Four, but after Bertha I don't expect a huge challenge. Flint leads with his Houndoom, who we immediately knock out with Thunderfang. Following Houndoom is Infernape, and we go for Thunderfang again, hoping for a crit, flinch, or paralyze. Somehow we got both a flinch and a paralyze, but we fail to knock out. Flint then uses a full restore, but two more Thunderfangs let us bring down Infernape. Flint then sends out his Rapid Ash, which proves no use against our mighty Thunderfang. Up next is Flareon, who also falls to Thunderfang. Flint's last Pokémon is his Magmortar, and despite being a Fire-type Sinnoh Pokémon and thus protected by national law, we obliterate it for the sake of clout. After casting Flint's Ashes to the wind, we're ready to take on Lucian. Lucian leads with his Mr. Mime, whom we annihilate with Crunch. Following Mr. Mime is Bronzong, who has come to take revenge for how we treated all those Bronzor earlier. We strike with Crunch, but fail to knock Bronzong out, meaning that we're hit with Earthquake, which takes half of our health. Lucian then heals up Bronzong, but we land another two crunches and bring this funny-looking bell down. Lucian's next Pokémon is his Espeon, who poses no threat at all after we crunch it in half. Alakazam is up next, who also falls to our crunch. Lucian's last Pokémon is his Gallade, who is half fighting type. What that means is that our crunch won't be one-shotting this time. We lower Gallade's defenses, but we're hit with Stone Edge, dropping us all the way down to a measly 5 HP. Fortunately for us, we're still faster than Gallade, with one more crunch bringing an end to this battle. 
All right, it's time for our last battle. Cynthia is here, the end is nigh, but more importantly, I guess Aram is a shapeshifter or something since she turned into a regular Shanks during this intro. I don't know, it's very odd. Anyways, Cynthia leads with her spirit tomb, and we choose to set up our double teams here. We set up with the full six double teams this time, getting hit only once by a shadow ball, which unfortunately lowered our special defense. When we're finally ready to fight, we take out spirit tomb with a single thunderfang. Up next is Cynthia's Garchomp and why we set up six double teams. We use Return, but we fall just short of one-shotting. Garchomp goes for Earthquake, but it misses, and we're able to bring down the Garchomp without issue. Cynthia's next Pokémon is her Milotic, which we handle easily with a Thunderfang. Cynthia then sends out her Roserade, and here we switch things up with a Return, getting a lucky crit to guarantee the one-shot. Up next is Togekiss, who has two moves that cannot miss despite our double teams. Fortunately for us, we've got Thunderfang and one-shot him. Cynthia's last Pokemon is her Lucario, who also has moves that cannot miss, but we get super lucky with a flinch for Thunderfang. One turn later and we bring down Lucario with one more return, becoming the new champion of the Sinnoh region. Wow, what a journey. I hadn't originally intended on doing a disobedient and obedient run, but I'm glad I did. I now have a completely new perspective on just how difficult disobedience can make a playthrough, and to be honest, I think it's a really cool mechanic. Ultimately, I'm still happy with this run, getting to play through the game twice with my first ever shiny Pokémon on the channel in this very special video. The final time for this run was 35 hours and 8 minutes, which makes Shinx the second slowest out of all of the Platinum runs so far. I've got no idea what made Shinx slower, and to be honest, I thought I was making pretty good time. If I had to guess, the extra grinding for Barry's fifth fight as well as all of the grinding on Iron Island probably soaked up a lot of time. Honestly, I had fun with this run, both of them mostly. The disobedient run with Arm was pretty fun since I never really knew what was going to happen, and the obedient run was fun because I was able to prove that yes, you can beat Pokemon Platinum with only Shinx. It was a pleasure to be able to beat a Pokemon game with the first ever Shiny I caught on this channel, and even though this run took a long time to get out, this run will always have a special place in my heart. If you guys want to come chat with me about the run, feel free to leave a comment or come say hi in my Discord, the link is in the description. Lastly, I wanted to give you guys one last little treat. I've done a lot of solo runs on YouTube now, and I'd like to branch out into something different to mix things up a bit. So with that said, here's a little sneak peek at what I'm cooking up next.